But ma- many of us have been around the church for a long time, and we love the church. And we kind of associate our faith with the church and coming to the church. How many people are like that? You've, you've been around the church maybe, maybe your whole life, and you love the church. Is, is there anybody that loves the church this morning? Uh, I'm glad to see a few reluctant hands go in the air uh, for that. When I was born in Pennsylvania in, in the month of December, and when I was two weeks old, I was in church. And uh, 20-some years later, my son was born, our first son, and he was born in December, and he didn't miss a Sunday because we lived in five little rooms right off of the church, and if you opened the door in our living room, you were right even with the platform in the church. And so my wife sat there with him in, in her arms uh, during church there. So, you know, we, we love the church. And, and people that, that have come to Christ recently, maybe, maybe I should ask that question. How many of you have only known the Lord maybe a few years or a decade or two, and, and you love the church? Is there anyone like that here this morning? Praise the Lord. We're glad that, that you're here. We're glad that, that you love the church. But I got news for you this morning. Not everyone loves the church. Not everyone loves Jesus. And you don't have to go very far to, to find that, that to be true. Uh, in the uh, Pew research in, in 2015, it, sa- it tells us by the interviews that the Pew research did that, um, that the number of Americans who describe themselves as Christians fell by eight points, from 78.4 to 70.6 between 2007 and 2014. And missiologist Alan Hirsch suggests that 40 to 50 percent of American population is reachable by the church, 40 to 50 percent. Do you know what that means if you put that in the negative? That means 50 to 60 percent of Americans are not technically reachable by the church as we know it, no matter how well we do things. Sometimes we think if we just sang better, if we just had more lights and better sound equipment, if the preacher would just preach better or shorter, as some of you would say, um, maybe we could just get more people. But Alan Hurst tells us that 50 50 to 60 percent of Americans won't come to church no matter what we do or no matter how well, we do it. And so the question is, how do we reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ who will never come to us? How do, how do we reach them? You see, Jesus came on a mission, and his mission was to reach the lost. And he commissioned us, we talked about this last week, every Christian and every church is commissioned by Jesus to reach lost people in every generation. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call righteous, but sinners. The the Gospel message is to to go to those who are lost. And and in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, again, I want to repeat this to us, that when Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's commissioned us to to continue His work and His mission to reach lost people. That's the basis of what the church is all about. Yes, we worship. Yes, we fellowship. Yes, we gather. And those are are important things. But the great mission of the church is to reach lost people. And today I want to just ask us a question. How do we do that? How do we reach people who will never come to us? People who are lost. People who Jesus loves. People who Jesus died for. People who wants to be... People who Jesus wants to be reached in this generation in America, how do we reach them? I have a little book that I've been reading and rereading. I've read through this book probably five times. I've given it out at some of our prayer gatherings. I've given it out um, to our local board of administration. 
And like I say, I've read through it five or six times. It only takes about an hour to read. If you're a slow reader, it might take an hour and a half. But uh, it's, it's just a few brief chapters. If you'd like one of these, it talks about fresh expressions of church. In other words, we think of church as coming to a building that looks something like this, and we, and we sing, and we pray, and hear a sermon, and we give an offering, and, and go home, a gathering of God's people. Uh, but there are ways that we need to be open to that are fresh, uh, and uh, they're fresh in a sense, but yet they're very biblical, going back to, to the book of Acts that we've been talking about. And so if you'd like one of these, on your uh, connection card, if you would just write the word book, I'll get that connection card, and uh, well, I actually get a report of, of the cards, and we'll order books for you. They're not expensive, and they're not long. If you want to read it, uh, I'd, I'd be glad to, to see that, that you get them. So uh, if, you, if you write books on your card, be sure to write your name on the card, too, so we know who, who the card came from. But this morning, I want us to... Um, to look at uh, the final message in our series, Multiply, and uh, the title of our message today is Build Bridges of Hope. Build Bridges of Hope. We've been talking about, uh, last month in the, in the beginning part of the book of Acts, a movement, a movement that went from one room, the upper room in Jerusalem, to one city, out into the city of Jerusalem, to two cultures, the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews, to wherever they were scattered by persecution, everyone went everywhere preaching and teaching and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we talked about the, the, the flywheel of, of momentum and, and movement and how to keep that going. And we, and we saw in the book of Acts how this just kept multiplying. We've looked at some of the uh, initial church builders. We talked about Peter and, and Cornelius, how the barrier came down between the Jews and the Gentiles and, and Cornelius and all the people that had gathered in his home were saved and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And last week we talked about the church at Antioch. And, and so in, in the book of Acts, there were really two churches that are identified. There were other churches in other places, but these two churches were identified. There, it was, there was the Jerusalem church. This, this church uh, had its foundation on the day of Pentecost. This is where most of the apostles were. This was kind of like church headquarters. In the Wesleyan Church, our headquarters are in Indianapolis, and, and uh, that was kind of the Indianapolis for the early church, was the city of Jerusalem. And, uh, and they attracted new believers. After Pentecost, there were thousands and thousands of people who came to Christ, but most of them were Jews, either Hellenistic Jews or Hebraic Jews who came to Jesus. The Antioch church was a church that was founded because of people who were persecuted and went there and, and shared the gospel. It was a creative church, it was a, it was a flexible congregation, and they engaged Greeks, people who some felt uh, some of the Jewish people and even Jewish Christians felt well, the gospel wasn't for them. They were reaching these people. And so there were different perspectives between these two churches and differing ideas about the, the importance of Jewish traditions and the law and all of those things and how involved the church in Jerusalem should be in what was happening in Antioch. And so they, they sent... Uh, the church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to help establish the work in Antioch, and, and some prophets came down to Antioch from Jerusalem. And so there was, there was kind of an outreach. Jerusalem was kind of the center, what, what is known today as the inherited church. It's the church that, that sends. And uh, they, they sent these men down there to, to, to get it. And, and there was a definite link between these two types of churches, the, the traditional, established church, and the cutting edge, reaching people that would not be reached by the other church. And, and Antioch recognized the value of Jerusalem's blessing and mentorship. And there were advocates in Jerusalem for what was happening in Antioch. The Antioch church connected with unreached people in ways that the Jerusalem church probably never could have. 
And so we see that the Jerusalem church and the Antioch church needed each other. The, the, the strong church that was established needed the church that was cutting edge to reach people that, others, that they would not reach, but the cutting edge church also needed the established church. And we're ministering today in a world where people have never heard the gospel or have a negative opinion of the church and have no interest in the church. And as an established church, missiologists are telling us there are some people that are just not going to open the door and come and sit in this room. Even if you invite them, even if you invite them to ride with you to church, even if you tell them you'll sit with them in church, even if you tell them you'll take them out to dinner after church, they're just not going to come. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we've talked about many times, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, we have taken that verse and we have looked at it from the perspective of geography. The, the words that are there, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, they are geographic locations. And we have created A1 Outreach in our church that's based on that model of ge geography. We have the local outreach team, the domestic and cross-cultural outreach team, and the global outreach team. But I want to just kind of give us a a different uh, perspective on, um, on that verse and, and that geography. At the, I want us to look at this as concentric circles. And we have the church people. Okay, we have, we have the church people. That, you and I that are here and, and, and our families uh, are the people. That's our Jerusalem. And we need to minister to people who come to church and love the church. They, they need to be ministered to. But beyond that, there is another circle. If there's any mathematicians here or architects, just make out that those are circles, okay? And that's the positive... Periphery. Okay? These are people that don't come to church regularly, but they don't hate the church. They just simply neglect the church. They might come at Christmas and Easter or for some kind of a special occasion, a baby dedication. They're here for a wedding. They're here for a funeral. They come to church. They don't hate the church. They're just not committed to the church. And then beyond that, okay, this, this is Jerusalem, Judea, and then Samaria are the de-churched and the distant. These are people who maybe grew up in the church. They've tried church, and they were hurt by church. They may have been hurt by church people. Someone may have judged them because of something they didn't like. I had the privilege this morning of meeting with our youth group, and they, the, the request was that I would talk to them about the sermon this morning. We talked about this. You know, sometimes some of the barriers that, that people have to coming to church is that they've been hurt by church, uh, and they've been hurt by church people. And that makes them uh, distant. Sometimes they're harder to reach than people who have never been to church or never even heard of church. People that, that live in countries where the gospel is, is not even preached. Uh, they, they have never heard. Uh, sometimes they're even harder to reach. And then beyond that are people who have no opinion and not interested.
These are people who kind of have a, an attitude toward the church that you and I might have in regard to a, a sect or a group of people um, that worship differently than I do, okay? Uh, for example, if, if I go past a, a Seventh-day Adventist church or a Jewish synagogue on a Saturday, I see their cars there, people there, maybe people are walking. I don't feel condemned because I don't go to the, that service. That's, that's not part of my day of worship. My day of worship is primarily Sunday. Now, I know today we have more services on, on other days of, week, of the week, and that is good, but I don't feel any kind of a draw or, or any condemnation because I'm not going to church on Saturday because I know the next day I'm going to, to church. Uh, or if I go past a Jehovah's Witness church, I don't, I don't feel condemned because I don't believe as they believe. I don't condemn them. I just don't have an opinion. I don't have... I don't have any interest. And, and so that's the way many people in our world live today. They, have, they just have no interest and no opinion. They drive by this church. Uh, they don't even wonder what, what we're doing in here. They just don't really care. Uh, they, just as, as we go play, play as other groups, and we, just, we don't know, perhaps. Uh, may, they might be friendly. But, uh, you know, if they have a big day, I won't be going, and probably you won't be going, and that's the way they look at it. We can do anything we want to get them to come, but they, are, they have no opinion and no interest. And so the question that we're addressing here is how do we reach the de-churched and the distant, and how do we reach those with no opinion and with no interest? And in our scripture this morning, as we, can, as we come to Acts chapter 15, this is the kind of question that is really being discussed. It's at the heart of that. And the question was, must the Gentiles practice the law and the traditions of Judaism in order to really be a Christian, including circumcision? And they, they addressed this. And there were some who were highly influenced by the Pharisees that said, yes, if they're going to be a Christian, they have to be circumcised and they have to live under the law. There were others that were saying, these are Gentile people. As Jewish people, we nor our fathers obeyed all the law. Uh, we, we, not, you know, we, we got in trouble with God because we couldn't obey the law. And so why would we put a burden on the Gentiles to live by what we couldn't live by and what our forefathers couldn't live by? And they discussed this. And the conclusion that they came to was that, that they were not going to put a great burden upon them. Peter spoke first at this council in Acts chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. He says, Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to do? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And then Paul and Barnabas, who uh, were, had been part of the church in Antioch, and they gave their testimony and in Acts 15, 12, it says, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. The same things that were happening in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and following the day of Pentecost were happening in Antioch among the Gentile people and, and some Jewish people. Then James, who at that point was head over the church, he was the brother of Jesus, he spoke up in Acts 15, 19, and he says, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. And so they decided to write a letter and send it back with Barnabas and Saul, and it told them that there were two things that they were supposed to do. The first one was that they were to abstain from sacrifice, food sacrificed to idols from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals. There, this had to do with the dietary law of the Romans, uh, excuse me, of, of, of the Jewish people, the, the kosher foods. And in, in Romans chapter 14, Paul kind of even backs off of that. And, and, and he says in, in Romans 14, 2 and 3, 
One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Praise God for the freedom that Paul gives, that we can eat meat. I would die, I think, without it. But um, ask my wife. I am a meat eater. You can ask Bubba. I buy some of my meat from Bubba. He knows that I love, love meat. The other thing that they put in the letter that they should abstain from was sexual immorality. And rather than backing away from that, in Paul's writing, in letter after letter, letter several different places, Paul affirms this need of abstaining from sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are against his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Now you might say, well, what is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality is any sexual relationship outside a marriage of a man and a woman. That's the biblical definition of marriage. God said, let a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they will be one flesh. And that was re repeated again and again in Scripture. And so God gave us our sexuality as a gift, but he put safeguards around it that it is to be used only within the bonds of marriage. And marriage is important. Some people will say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. Oh, it's just words. And if you go down to the justice of the peace and you don't believe in God, maybe that is true. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your wedding vows are important. Right down here we have Deb and Tony. They stood right here this, yesterday and they were married by uh, Andy. I think we ought to celebrate with them on that, that choice. Those vows are important. Yesterday was also Jane and my 45th wedding anniversary. Thank you. And there have been times in our marriage that love alone would not have kept us going. We talk about, oh, I fell in love. And then before long, people were falling back out of love. You know what keeps you going for 40 years, 45 years, 50 years, 60 years, 65 years, 70 years? You know what keeps you going until death is a commitment to your vows. You don't always feel love. You, you don't always feel like loving. But you're always married. You see? And that kind of bond is the, is the relationship that God designed for sexual uh, relationships. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 8, he, he affirms this again. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in a passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins, as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so those were the things that they decided. They didn't want to... They didn't put a whole lot of burden on those Gentiles who were coming to Christ. They said there's only two things that are important, the relationship of, of eating meat to idols and sexual immorality, and Paul even reduced it further just to uh, abstain from sexual immorality. And so if we're going to reach people who won't come to church, how do we do it? 
Well, rather than putting up barriers to people coming to Christ, we need to build bridges to people that they would come to Christ. If you wanted to write this down, I hope you have, because I'm going to get rid of it right now. And The list was on the screen. We can look at it this way. Over here on this side, and again, all you architects and artists, excuse that, but that's the church, okay? And over here, okay, there, there's a whole bunch of people that aren't going to come to Christ, okay? That, should re that really needs to be excused. But... Um, Okay, and there's a great chasm between. Now, for some people in the church, the option is this, okay? If they want to come to church, they know where we're at, they can come. But there's all kinds of things that are here that are keeping them from coming. That they're... We're living in a time in America where generations of people have never been taught to go to church. They grew up not going to church. Their parents grew up going, not going to church. Their grandparents didn't go to church. They don't even think about church. There are people that we've talked about already who have been hurt by church or hurt by people in the church who have felt judged and, and disappointed by the church. There are some people who hear about sin and they love their sin. They, want to, they, don't, they don't want to give up their sin. Okay? There are some people that feel, feel condemned when they go to church. When, when they hear uh, what I just shared uh, from Romans chapter uh, 15 and, and, and other places in, uh, in regard to sexual immorality. People don't like that. All those things that can, that can come between us. Uh, some people just have a very rationalistic mind and it's hard them, for them to even understand the concept of faith. How can you believe in a God that you can't see? Uh, and, and on and on. There's all kinds of barriers here. But some people in the church say, hey, we're here. The doors are open. We have a sign outside. They know what time to come. If they want to be here, come. Okay? And they make no effort to bridge the, the, the gulf. And then there are other people, other churches, who kind of, that's supposed to be a span that holds the bridge up. Okay? Some build a bridge across there, and they'll go over here and talk to those people and try to convince them that they ought to go to church. And that's, that's better than the first option. There's effort there. They're trying to bridge the gap. And there are some of these people who will come to church. There are some of you here today that grew up in a home like I talked about where nobody ever went to church. Uh, perhaps even you loved uh, your life of sin. But somehow, some way, a pastor, a, a relative, a neighbor, a co-worker, somebody built a bridge to you and they showed you kindness and they lived a godly life in front of you and they were people of integrity and, and you began not necessarily to believe their faith but you believed that they believed their faith. There, there became a reality in their faith and you came along with them and, and found Jesus to be your Savior. The third option is to build the bridge and go over here and minister to them in the name of Jesus right there where they are. They may never come back here. They may never come back here. But you reach out to them and, and you try to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ in the culture where they are and, and, and where, where they are in life. Okay, these, these concepts I'm sharing with you, like I said in the introduction come from fresh expressions, but they deal 
in the same kinds of things that we're talking about in the book, in the book of Romans. And I shared this last Sunday night uh, with our, those who came for the prayer time and the planning meeting about the Salkin Valley. Uh, there's a pathway of creating a fresh expression. And, and we can't necessarily have a preconceived idea of how that's going to look. Now, four years ago, I, I prayed and fasted and felt like God gave us a vision, but some of the details were based on what I knew at the time. And so what we've been praying for is a, an established church, that, that we would go into the Salkin Valley and establish a church. But the circumstances have changed, and uh, after four years, we, we don't have a campus pastor, and, and, and uh, so we, we need to be flexible. I, uh, I, I talked to several people, and I shared this with you before, about our plan, and I got A-plus grade on the plan. I've studied and talked to people and had, had mentors and read lots of books and things online and went to conferences, and I put a plan together, and, and some of the leading people in our denomination who are involved in leading uh, church multiplication said, that's a great plan, but it's a great plan in a perfect world, and we're not in a perfect world. And so you have to be flexible. And so we need to be flexible with what God opens to us. And, and the first step to having a, a fresh expression is to pray and to wait. We have been doing that. We've been praying for four years. You've been giving for four years. We've been looking for a campus pastor for for four years. We've been trying to learn. We could, we've been trying to read everything we can, and Fresh Expressions was just given to me this spring, and, and it, it opened new uh, vistas for, for me as, as a pastor to think about what we can do. But we, we pray and we wait, and then we listen. Okay? We, we don't go into the Salkin Valley and say, hey, we, we know exactly what you need, and here we are, and we're going to establish another cross point that looks like the one in Bethlehem. We want you to come. There are no, like, no more likely, the people that are far from God are no more likely to come to cross point in Salkin Valley than what they are to come to this cross point. And so, so we need to go in and listen, and we've been listening. Uh, Andy, who, who was appointed by the board to kind of lead our planning team, the outreach team for Salkin Valley, and I have been talking to people. God moved a lady into the house next to Jane and I about a year and a half ago who is a, a, a guidance counselor at the Salkin Valley Elementary School in Hellertown. And I've been talking to her, and she's going to get me a list of things that they need, and we're going to collect items that we can give to students in that Salkin Valley Elementary. And, and some people say, oh, the Salkin Valley, that's the richest area in the community. There are poor people who live there. There are people who cannot feed their families, that cannot buy school supplies. There are teachers that have to, out of their own pockets, go and buy supplies, and we can help them. If we want to be heard in the Salkin Valley, we, the first thing that we have to do is listen. And so we're getting lists of things that, that we can do. And then the second thing that we do is we begin loving and serving. When we get these lists, when we listen and we hear, and that's, that's just the starting point. There's more that we can listen to and, and hear from the Salkin Valley. But we're, we're going to gather then. When we have a list, we're going to gather. And I'm going to ask you to bring things uh, that, that we can give. It may not be the traditional school supplies. She said sometimes it's things that they need in the classroom or other things that, uh, that they may need. And then we begin to build community. We've seen this happen to the, uh, the Clearview Elementary over here. We've been doing things with them for a number of years in the Good News Club, and we have a, a wonderful relationship with the principal there. It, it was great. A couple years ago, we, we had some 
toys to take in for them to distribute in the school to children that maybe wouldn't have a Christmas gift, and, and to watch our children's director walk through the door and have the principal come out and give her a hug. That's, that's a good relationship, and that's what we want to do down there. We want to meet people and build community with people that live in that area. And then to begin to, to explore discipleship. Okay. Perhaps start a small group or a couple small groups. Uh, maybe using something like um, alpha. I couldn't think of the first, letter, the first letter of the Greek alphabet there for a second. But alpha, it's a program that's based to reach unchurched people, people who have no background in, in, in Jesus. Perhaps we can start some discipleship groups down there and then as we meet people and get them in discipleship, we can begin to see a church taking shape. It might be a group of 10 to 12 people that meet in somebody's home. It could be a, a, a dinner church or a brunch church or something where food is given and, and attract people in. It may be that someday God will provide a campus pastor and he'll be able to bring groups together. And we might still have a number of fresh expressions, but then also have a nearby established church that they'll be able to go in. It's in God's hands. We're not telling God how to do this, and we're not telling the people down there what we're going to do for them. We're going to listen and we're going to develop, and, and as it goes along, a, a church will take shape. And you know what we do when this is happening? We do it again. Our goal is not to start a church in the Salkin Valley. That's just the initial pitch. You know, before a baseball game, they have a, a special, somebody comes and they throw out the first pitch of the ball game. And the Salkin Valley is just the first pitch. We want to see churches all the way to Philadelphia. We want to see churches across into New Jersey and across to, to Newark, all, all across there. You do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And you start by listening and loving and serving and building com community. And as we begin to disciple people and see a church take shape, and we can do it over and over again. And you don't have to have multitudes. We heard the video last Sunday of a church of 150 people who started Kent Community Church that grew to thousands. And they sent a group all the way from Michigan to Georgia and started 12 Stone, which is now the largest Wesleyan church in America. And they have sent out other churches and on and on, several different churches that are like that. And so we begin to, to move on. This is a model that John Wesley used as well. Wesley's power, powerful messages were not welcome in the Church of England. You know, sometimes you think I'm a little tough on, on uh, you preaching. Uh, Wesley would preach a, a sermon, and they'd say, you're not ever welcome to come back into this church again. And so he'd go someplace else where he could get an invitation, and he'd preach there, and they'd say, you're not welcome to come back and preach in this church again. And over and over again, and finally reluctantly, he went out and started preaching out in the fields. And people by the thousands came and were part uh, to hear his messages. And so he went out in the open fields and he preached to great crowds. He engaged people in class meetings, societies, and band meetings. He established churches. And often those churches were led by lay people. And then he moved on to other communities. Um, Chris Backard, who is the national director of Fresh Expressions, lives in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And he told our district superintendent, Wesleyans are uniquely designed for fresh expressions. It's our heritage. It's our DNA. You see, we don't see it happening much anymore, but we've gotten away from who we are. This is exactly how Wesley spread the movement. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, 
Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Last Sunday evening, we had a prayer gathering and a planning meeting, and we filled this board from side to side, from top to bottom, with ideas that can be done. The next question is, who's going to do it? It's not the kind of thing that you can say, well, we, we hired the pastor, he can do it. Or Andy's been put in charge of an outreach team, he can do it. No, this is going to take people. This is going to take commitment. This is going to take work. This is going to take backing. And the question is, who's going to be on the team? We, ha we have a team leader, but we don't have a team. And we need workers. And so I want to encourage you again to pray and ask God whether he wants you to be on this team. You might say, I don't live in the Salkin Valley. You don't have to live in the Salkin Valley. You have a car. You can drive to the Salkin Valley to reach people for Jesus. Going back to to the, to the model about the cavern. You don't expect people from the Salkin Valley to drive here if they don't know Jesus. We drive to the Salkin Valley and we reach them where they live. We, we cross over, not a, mount, or not a cavern, but we cross over a mountain to go to reach people rather than expecting them to come to us. And who is going to be on the team? It's great to be part of the prayer team. I thank God for the people who have prayed. I thank God for the people who have given. Over $33,000 have been given over the last couple years, and I thank God for those who give, and I, I encourage you to continue to give. But now we're getting where the rubber meets the road, where we begin to do the work. The harvest is plenteous. 50 to 60% of Americans are out there that need to be reached. Who's going to join us in helping to reach them? And I trust that you will pray about that. And we're not asking you to leave this church. We're just asking you to help do the work of reaching people there, as well as we continue to reach people here with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question for, Rome, or for the Jerusalem church in, in the book of Acts was, do we put up barriers to keep people out? And the answer was no. We build bridges. We help try to reach people with the gospel. We are in that position. We know that there are a lot of lost people here and everywhere. Who's going to reach them? Who's going to do the work? And I trust that the Holy Spirit would speak to you and speak to me of how we can be involved in reaching people who will never come to this location and walk through these doors. How do we reach them? We build bridges of hope to them. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you today for your great grace. We thank you, Lord, that you left heaven and came to earth on a mission to seek and to save the lost. And you paid the ultimate price by laying down your life on the cross. You won the ultimate victory by rising again from the grave. And you ascended back into heaven and you're sitting at the Father's right hand, interceding for us right now. Lord, you know the answers. You know how. You know who. Lord, I pray that you would reveal it to each of us who you want to be involved in doing the work. Each of us have been designed by you to do the work that you have given us to do. There are some, Lord, that you're calling to pour their hearts into this church, into the children's ministry, into the youth ministry, into worship. There are others, Lord, that you're calling to be part of what's happening on the other side of the mountain. Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to follow you. Help us not to rush ahead nor lag behind. And help us, Lord, to do what you would have us to do. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people of integrity, 
Help us to be people that live a lifestyle that is pleasing to you, that you can bless, that you can use for your glory. And Lord, we pray that many of those people, the missiologists tell us, will not come to the church. May many of those people be in heaven someday because the church went to them. May you be glorified. May your kingdom be upheld. Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here right now in this room who's never made a decision to follow Jesus, that they would pray this prayer with me in their heart. Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin like all human beings. I've committed acts of sin. Perhaps I've even been rebellious toward you. But today I repent. I change my mind. I turn around. I change my direction. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to forgive my sin and put me in a right relationship with God our Father. And today I choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And with your help, I intend to live every day the rest of my life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would answer that prayer in the hearts of someone today. May you be glorified and help us all, dear Lord, to search our hearts for you what you want us to do. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.